Thank you for choosing to listen to this message from our pastor, Brother Rob Coons. Let us enter now with the saints of God into a service already in progress. Let's listen to see what God might speak to us this morning, okay? Amen. Can we give Brother Rob a hand as he comes? Do you appreciate what they've done? I appreciate it. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Amen. Hallelujah. You love him this morning. Amen. He's worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't feel like I stand to receive any kind of applause, but I know that there's one named Jesus. Amen. It's worthy of all applause. Hallelujah. Let's just bow our head a moment of prayer. Father, as we find ourselves standing before you, before the throne of God, Father, as we come by faith, Lord God, through grace, Father, we ask you, Lord, to have your way this morning. Fathers, we stand before such an awesome and such a great people with such an awesome understanding, Lord God, as we submit our mind and our hearts and our thoughts to you, Lord, not looking to man for any kind of revelation, any kind of understanding, or any kind of great wisdom or knowledge, Lord, but calling upon your throne, Lord God, knowing that the revelation is by the Spirit of Christ, Lord God, and we call upon you this morning and ask you, Lord God, to grant revelation unto us, Open up our eyes and our ears, Lord God, that we could hear and comprehend and understand what your spirit, Lord God, would say unto the church, Father. We love you and we thank you, Lord God, with a great expectation of thee. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all may be seated. It's a wonderful thing to be in the house of the Lord this morning. You know, when we think of Father's Day, and I still have my father uh, with us, Brother Howard. Many of you know him and come down to camp meeting and... uh, with us here this last time and and i appreciate my father i think back naturally speaking you know my father made a lot of mistakes you know but i look back and i think about the many things that he did try to impart or to to share with us and my brothers and learn how to hold down a job and work and and he put something in our heart that we start a job we stay with it and we finish a job and those are things that i could look to my natural father in a way of recognizing and commending him as his uh abilities and duties as a natural father and there again as brother mike said honoring the father paul said you know have you got you in the gospel or fathered you in the gospel and i appreciate the fact of being here a place has such awesome memories you know when you think as a natural child and you look back to natural uh childhood you know you'll have all different kinds of memories some good and some bad you might say and and um, of all different kinds of things and remember the the years of discipline and the years of encouragement and so many things and it's the same way when i come here to little bethlehem i think you know you can't you can't just walk around the grounds or be here without uh reminiscing somewhat in your mind of the many great things and and um i spent five years five years here to the day that brother pike sent me up to north carolina and some say, well, I don't think it was quite long enough. I think you needed to sit under them a little more. And I said, I wish I had that opportunity, brothers and sisters. You know, you find that when you grow in the grace and knowledge of God, you wish that you had the presence to sit with a great father of the gospel like that after you come to more understanding because then you would feel like the time that you did spend with him would be more quality and you would be able to glean more and draw more with a more understanding to really get the depths of the things that Brother uh, George was teaching us. You know, I could say that uh, having a career in aviation many, many years back, it seems like. But, you know, if I would have had, you know, more hours of of flying and been out there and and made more failures and more different things as a pilot, when you sit amongst the great pilots, then you would understand more of what they're trying to say. And, uh, and again, you know, Lord has his way in all things. But um, I do, again, uh, appreciate... Uh, brother George Pike and I do consider him as a great father in the gospel and I'm very thankful and appreciative and um, you know it's one thing to talk about a great man of God but it's another thing to continue on and try to do what would be pleasing to him and uh, I like what brother Mike says and I think we all could say this that if brother George uh, come back among us today I think we would all be in for some really strong preaching and some chastening of the Lord and and I think we'd all be standing there for some uh, discipline and uh, but then on the other hand I believe that the the pastor would say brother and I appreciate your efforts and your endeavors and the things ever uh, sometimes we might look at them they might ever seem so small to the great magnitude that was happening here and maybe the endeavor sometimes ever seems so small but you know what I think he'd be well pleased that we 
try to go on and do something is unto the Lord Jesus. Amen. I'm going to take a Bible here and, and um, do some reading uh, this morning. Maybe you take your Bibles with me. Something fell out here. Maybe these were some notes some other preacher used. Maybe I could just borrow them this morning. Amen. Help me out here just a little bit. And uh, I want you to turn with me over to the uh, Gospel of John this morning. Y'all remember why we're turning over there. Remember uh, Sister Jameson. I've heard a few reports of her over in areas of Colorado. I'm not sure if she's home now. I'm sure many of you know. But regardless if she's at home or still in the hospital, whatever it may be, remember her in prayer and pray for her and her family that the comfort of the Holy Ghost could come and help them in this time. And, and uh, Sister Lambert is uh, still over here in some rehabilitation. Brother Jerry had a good report yesterday of... Uh, her up walking uh, bitch yesterday, and remember her also in, in prayer. And, um, you know, brothers and sisters, sometimes we get going along in life and in health and different things, and we don't consider others in their afflictions. And there should be something in our hearts as Christians, you know, to, to feel the infirmities of others. When you see brethren or sisters, whatever it may be, going through afflictions and different things, we need to remember that. You know, so oftentimes we, you know, we get into a, such a small little circumference of our own little world, and we judge everything from our world. We judge everything from the way we would perceive it, and the way that we would look at it, and the way that we would understand it. But sometimes we got to separate ourselves from our world and back off a little bit and look at it from another man's world. I think. Uh, I don't know if you'd call it a proverb or what you'd call it, but they said the Indians used to say, you know, once you walk a mile in my moccasins, you know, before you make some sort of a, uh, a judgment, you know. And, and it's so easy, brothers and sisters, to step in and make, make judgments of things the way we think they should be. But sometimes when we get our eyes opened up and back away from things, we see it, see it so much differently. Again, we're over in the Gospel of John. I want to go to about the 11th uh, chapter there. Just pray that we find the mind of the Lord here this morning. I was kind of encouraged here, Brother Michael, come up here. He looked like he was ready to go. And I'm thinking, praise God. I was, I was right down there on the Amen pew. And uh, that, if you don't know the Amen pew, it's one about where Jim, Brother Jim's sitting there. And when I was here, I used to sit right over there. And many times it was the old me pew also. And uh, it just depended on the direction. But I'll tell you, I thank God for a man of God that came with the word and would speak the word uh, boldly. And uh, he wasn't looking for favoritism. He wasn't looking to tickle ears. He came with the word of God. And, he, and, you know, we're a product, brothers and sisters, each and every one of us, in whatever measure we may be. You know, I don't know. You know, some say 30, 60, 100 fold. I don't know where I would fit in there. Some of you might say, well, you might be lucky if you're five. You know what? The five I like because I'm walking in the best I can, amen, and trying to do the best that I can, not trying to... Uh, be something, you know, the Bible said you wait on whatever measure it is. If it's preaching or teaching, you know, you wait on that measure. And I find that if you try to go outside that measure, just not going to work, amen. But whatever it is, you know, sometimes we think uh, people need great, awesome revelation. And I'll tell you, to talk about the mysteries of God and the revelation of the Lord is an awesome thing. But I find, brothers and sisters, that sometimes when we're out here, people just need to hear the good old... Good old uh, gospel story, amen. There's people still in this day and hour just need to know about the love of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. And, you know, the mysteries isn't what wins people to the Lord Jesus. You know, and understanding the revelation of the Lord, it's simply revealing Christ in your own life and letting the revelation of Christ live in you that they could see something to put a hope and a drawing within them unto the thanks of God. I believe we'll just start right here at the first part of this chapter and read a little bit as the Lord allows. It says, Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death. But for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Could you ever see, think, and consider sickness as something to the glory of God? Let me stop right there for a moment, just share a little story 
just for a quick second, we'll finish reading on, but a, a dear friend of mine that helped me, and uh, when I was very young in the Lord, just come to the Lord and was going through a lot of uh, childhood growth in the in, uh, Word of God. You know, and I, I didn't understand spirits and spirits of inheritance, and I didn't understand a lot of those things as young in the Lord, and, and there was a lot of Brother Rob Coons still alive. And... Uh, and as I was growing and dealing with things, this one brother, he took and helped me greatly over in the areas of Oklahoma. Well, I talked with him not many days back. He's up uh, about 70 years old now, going through afflictions in his body and, and been diagnosed with uh, Parkinson's disease. And the brother, you know, he, he, I was talking with him and he said, you know, Brother Rob, he said, it really, uh, he said, you know, I'm believing that Jesus is a healer and I know that he's healed me. And he said, I'm waiting on this to manifest, and I'm doing everything I can to stand in faith and to believe. But he said, I'm a very sick man. And, um, and he says, you know, I, I get tore up. I go to church, and the brethren come up to me and say, where's your faith? And I tried to encourage him, and I said, brother, uh, his name's Brother Jerry. And I said, Brother Jerry, I said, don't let that discourage you. I, you know, we got to think about when the Lord Jesus, the great physician and the healer, was on the cross, they said, hey, heal thyself. If you're who you say you are, come down off that cross. Amen. And sometimes, you know, people that we could be around us that should be encouraging and strengthening us in those things, sometimes will say things that would ever destroy what faith and different hope that you may have there and make you start looking. And I, I shared with Brother Jerry, I said, you know, brother, I said, God is having his way in this in your life. He's got children that aren't serving God. He's got children that, that are in the world and partaken of the world that have not came in uh, and made the Lord Jesus the King and Lord of their life. And I said, you know, brother, I said, the Lord is a soul winner, and he's having his way to win souls in your life. I said, you know, the thing is, is your family's watched you for many years as in your strength and in your youth and in your health and in prosperity. I said, you've been a businessman. You've sowed into the things of God and the kingdom of God, and God has raised you up. And they saw you serve God while your health is good and while your finances are strong and everything's going well. But you know what? The Lord has allowed this affliction to come, for they could see that in the infirmity... And in this day that you still lifting your hands up and, and testifying that Jesus Christ is King and Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, God has His way in these things. And when they see that, you know, this Lord must be true. I think of the great man of God, Brother Pike here. Many times, brothers and sisters, he would come out and pour his heart out, lay hands on, on the brethren for healing and things. And there was so many things happening in his body. But he would still testify God in his healing. He testified God in his power every single day. You know, brothers and sisters, many times people look at a man of God and say, well, you know, if you were truly a man of God, it would be like this or be like that, you know, or, or different things. But brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. We could talk about a lot of great men of God and great faith that have gone by the way of the grave, you know, that they've gone that direction. You know, if, if we're going to start in the, if we're going to start over here in the New Testament, go all the way through, and people think, well, if this was a man of God, you know, he would be this or that. But brothers and sisters, you know, this this whole body is on a collision course, brothers and sisters, to corruption. Amen. I know the scriptures. He said he suffered not that holy one to see corruption, and I know that we have a great hope and faith in a resurrection, brothers and sisters, when we're thinking of in the natural dimension of this natural body. Well, let's read on here, maybe as we're speaking, possibly on the resurrection, the Lord might uh, help us here a little this morning, amen. It says, Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, in whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that he said this, sickness is unto death, but, but the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now, Jesus loved Martha and his sister and Lazarus. When he had heard Therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. After that saith he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples saying unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again. Let me, let me drop down just a little bit. Let's drop down to um, 
to about verse 17. It says, Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about fifteen furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever that thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, Though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Now, brothers and sisters, when we read the scriptures as such, you know, we find the sisters speaking, you know, about a future resurrection. You know, well, yes, I, you know, and she's saying, I have this faith. I have faith that, you know, he is going to resurrect in this resurrection. But see, Jesus is bringing another thought to her altogether. He said, I am the resurrection. And in the day and hour that we live in, brothers and sisters, we many times are putting a faith and a hope in a distant future. You know, the Bible says that a deferred hope sickeneth the heart. And you realize that in the, the church world of this day and hour is, has had such a deferred hope of the resurrection and had such a deferred hope in it that it is a sickeneth heart within the religious realms in America. In this day and hour. The condition of the people because they're taking a biblical truth and they're understanding it in a dimensional perspective. And they're looking at everything in a natural sense instead of understanding what has really taken place in the spirit and what truly the Lord has truly done for each and every one of us. You know, when you start getting into, you know, I know we're not called to dispute over uh, things. We're called in defense of the word of God. But, you know, when you get out amongst the denominational world or the churches and different things, many times people would think that you're there to dispute with them. You know, and the Bible commands us not to get into these vain controversies and different things. And we have to be very cautious. But then yet we have to defend the word of God. And there's things that we have been indoctrinated with, brothers and sisters, in the revelation of the Lord, that we have to use much wisdom in how to share the light that we have been uh, encountered with and been fellowshipping with and how we bring it out into darkness to share with other people. We could be bold as a line and sometimes when we need to, to dim our light, so to speak, and start spoon feeding. And I'm going to say some things here if the Lord allows, but maybe share a little, um, a couple things that's been taking place here. You know, we watch things, brothers and sisters, uh, the best we can. I remember Brother Pike down in the basement one time was speaking And he he made a statement. He said, well, I see that this is going to go in this direction by revelation. And I'm thinking, you know, being from a charismatic church world and being out there amongst the Pentecostals and different things, I would hear uh, ministers speak in a prophetic way or say, you know, I heard a prophecy go forth and it said, thus saith the Lord that this is going to take place. You know, I maybe heard a tongue and an interpretation of saying something that was going to take place. You might have heard one say, you know, I had a vision or a dream and they believed that this is what was going to take place. But Brother Pike was watching something by revelation. And, uh, you know, and I didn't understand that when I came here. And I listened and I thought, well, what, what is he meaning by this? And, and we found it over years and over time that trying to come into the same mind and the same kind of thoughts to whatever measure it may be, you know, that we could start learning and watching things by what we would say a revelation of uh, watching it. And, and I could say this before I go any farther, that sometimes, you know, we get... Uh, types and shadows and allegories, and we uh, misunderstand that for revelation. And uh, just as a man could have works and he apply his works, he could misunderstand that for faith. And when you have faith, there will be works, and when you have revelation, there will be some allegories and some types and shadows. But I will say this, that I've observed as a minister and as a Christian for many years that many times allegories and types and shadows lead people astray. They think that they're following revelation or think that they're following some, and it's a type and shadow. And it's... um. I remember when I come here, Brother Pike said he was, he was very troubled at my name being Rob. And then he said the coon had to do with the mass band. And he said it really troubled him. And he went to the Lord in prayer. And he said it had to do with robbing the death 
of its victory and the grave of its crown. And, and it brought him some peace. Well, I had a brother, and this is what I was going to say, show up here at the church not long back. And his name is Martin. And I was, when I was in the aviation world, I was working on an aircraft called a Martin. I specialized in it. Well, Brother Pike was kind of talking about an airplane, and, and, um, and I happened to know of one over in Colorado that I had licensed, and it was ready to go, and it was a really good airplane and a good price. And I mentioned it to him, and he didn't show no interest in it. You know, and I didn't understand those things, but, you know, then finally he said, well, you know, this kid, you know, he's pressing a little bit. I'm going to have to explain this to him. So he said, you know, Martin had to do with a blackbird. And, you know, and he's speaking of angels and spirits and things, and he said, you know, we just, you know, couldn't go that route. You know, but naturally speaking, for an, for an aircraft, it would have been a good airplane. Well, here's this kid shows up named Martin. His last name is George. And, you know, and I thought, well, that's something. You know, I'm seeing, you know, something that represents darkness. And then when we think of the, the, the founding father of, of the ministry and different things, I'm thinking, George, and I say, you know, what is this? You know, it looks like we got light and darkness coming right in amongst us all at the same time. So I would be a little bit troubled to watch it. And, you know, and I'd pray and ponder on it. And there's a, there's a beautiful thing in the mind of it and in the, re- in the revelation of it as the Lord helped me. You know, sometimes we can think that we're following after a revelation or something, you know, and say, man, this man has to do with darkness and put somebody out that God has sent and has come to you that really needs help and really needs indoctrination. Well, this brother's father was a minister. As a matter of fact, pastored a church there in the High Point area. And uh, his father had passed away this last year. And he's been coming over, drawing some strength, and seems to be a fine young man. Well, he brought his mother to church just here this last Wednesday night. Her name happens to be Esther, and her last name George. You know, and I got to pondering and thinking about those things, you know, and the sister come to church. And, and sometimes as a minister, you know, the Bible talks about leaving the 99 and going after the one. You know, and we think, oh, yeah, that's when the pastor's gone and he goes off into town after this one that's backslid or, you know, and we know the doctrine of backslid, but we just use it as a term or one that maybe slipped away a little bit or something. You know, there he goes. But I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, there's many times that the pastor might have, you know, the, the few out there, whatever it may be, but he leaves all of them to go after the one. Well, as his sister came in and she sat down in the church and she had her little notepad out. So I put a few little things out there and I'm watching her writing the notes. You know, and I thought, well, she seemed to receive that pretty well. You know, so I put just a little bit more out there, and she'd look and maybe make a couple more notes. So I found myself totally ministering to this sister that came in and had a good spirit about her and a good hunger and a drawing after the things of God. So I just kept presenting things, and we had a rather lengthy service, and I thought, like Brother Pike used to say, well, I'll just keep on feeding. He said, it's like the little baby pulling at the breast. He said, after it eats so much, it'll fall off. So I'm thinking, well, you know, pretty soon it's got to fall off. <laughs> you know, it's going to go to sleep here sometime or another, and I just kept on going, and after about, I guess, probably about an hour and a half, she finally started slipping off, so I said, okay, it's time to close. But I was talking with the wife on the way down here of what her having to do with, and we think of Esther in the Bible, and we think of Bashi, how she... Uh, denied to go in before the king to give the benevolence unto him and when she denied that we find that Esther was called and taken in you know and there's a real revelation in that brothers and sisters do it the present day truth in the church ages I'm not saying these things saying well you know it has to do with High Point North Carolina or it has to do with me I'm talking about the message brothers and sisters that we're in has been rejected by the church They have not taken and gone into the Holy of Holies in before the Lord because they have not accepted what Christ has really truly done for them and given them the power, brothers and sisters, to be clean and pure before the Lord by the washing and cleansing of the blood of Jesus, and they've trampled it under feet. But this sister being representative of this charismatic order and day here shows a time of coming in, even to the son being named Martin. You know, and we see, we see a darkness, brothers and sisters, but when the Jews come back in, we know that it's going to be that redeeming this thing back in that would be considered as something and put out and something that's dark. And we need to be very tentative and very careful of watching these things by the Spirit of God and looking, brothers and sisters, to what is happening in your midst and happening around about you. There is a collective thing. There is a collective thing that's happening within the church world. There's a collective thing that's happening globally, a global perspective of what God is doing right now in the mind of the Lord for a 
for the people of God and for the Jews. There's a collective thing happening, but brothers and sisters, many times you can't have so much control of what's collectively happening, but there's things happening within your midst, within your own life, amen, that we need to be sensitive to and we need to be watching in the mind of God and making ourselves available to the things. You know, Brother George coming over yesterday and helping the brother, and I said, you know, brother, this is where this is where it starts at right here by committing our works unto the Lord. And when we commit our works unto God, brothers and sisters, then our thoughts could be established. And a man that doesn't have established thoughts cannot do anything unto the Lord. He'll be double-minded. He'll be unstable in all of his ways. He'll find himself going and coming and going and coming. We'll find temporal zealousness, you know, of, you know, man, praise God. You know, we've all witnessed these things as brethren. We'd be here trying to make ourselves available in labor, and a brother would get a little touch over here or another one over there or something happened with a great inspiration and come in and run hard for a day or two and then gone. You see, there's no reward in that. Brothers and sisters, we've got to be steady and be stable and keep doing whatever it is. Many times we think that we've got, you know, great callings or whatever, and we're looking way beyond up there and saying, well, this is what I'm going to do and this is where I'm going to be. But, you know, sometimes we've got to go and start out wherever the Lord would put us at. You know, I raised up in the aviation business, and it was handed to me. And the thing is, is I was raised up probably too fast at different times and, and put on much responsibility. But there was still, I could not, you know, go from the single-engine airplane to flying, you know, the, the airplane with four engines and with uh, great loads and going over fires and putting fires out, you know, from starting to finish. There was a course that had to be walked and shown myself uh, loyal to the business and learned in the business and skilled in the business, and it was something that progressed along. And many times we, uh, you know, one would say, well, if we had faith, we can go from, you know, from the bottom right to the top. Well, that's the only way you'll ever get there, but there's still a transformation on the way, amen. And we are people that believe in dimensional projections, and we know what's happening by the works of Christ in the Spirit and what He has done for us. But let's speak about this resurrection just for a moment. You know, many times we find ourselves, brothers and sisters, that we will be in a disagreement with people in some of their doctrines that are teaching certain things out in the church. And so we start off with controversy and it sets us apart. And when it sets us apart, we cannot have any relation with them in the perspective of feeding them or helping them to come out of that. Do you realize that when I came here to Little Bethlehem, I was under a different doctrine than what you brethren was under? I learned a lot of things out there that I come to find out after I came to be indoctrinated, brothers and sisters, that I had to put away. But thank God that there was a man of God that saw, you know, through mercy and through the blood of the Lord Jesus and said, you know, he probably thought, oh gosh, here we go again. You know, another one coming in. But you know, brothers and sisters, he loved me and helped me and over, helped me to overcome many of my failures and shortcomings and doctrines that were in error. And now see, we have to be the very same way. When we get out here, we can start off with the controversies with people. And we can start, you know, bringing these controversies out. And many times it's sad to say that many people go right into the controversies to make themselves look like, well, I've got something that you don't. And many times it's a competitive thing, you know, of, you know, well, look, bless God, I've read the Bible more. I sit under a great man of God. And you find these competitions. And, and you know, that's not of God. You know, we find ourselves here uh, as brotherhood, you know, we find that we, we fellowship with some of the people that call themselves the message churches. You know, we find these different brethren and we, we say, boy, you poor pitiful people, if you could just come to know what we know. You know, <clears throat> we, we raised up under Brother George Pike and, you know, we're not no longer agreement with you. And we find this competition, you know, well, my daddy's better than your daddy. You know, brothers and sisters, we've got to use a little bit of wisdom and stay away from that kind of foolishness. And... <clears throat> You know, I'm not called, and don't, don't take this up wrong or disrespectful, I'm not called in defense of Brother George Pike, but I am called in defense of one thing, and that's the message that he preached, amen, and that's what he stood for, amen. Now, I'm, that doesn't mean I'm going to sit and let somebody talk about my pastor and run him down. That's just not going to happen with me, and I've had some of them trying to don't work. They're not going to have an audience for very long. Uh, but, but what I'm saying, brothers and sisters, we need to defend the Word of God, the, go the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. And I found that's what Brother Pike had come to do. 
And I believe that Brother Branham was a great man of God, and I believe that's what he was going to do. Amen. And we need to take the same spirit, as I said not many days back. A man asked me, he said, are you a message church? And I said, yes, I am a message church. Amen. And the thing is, is that might have made him think that I was in this message, and they would consider me a Branhamite or whatever you might say. But, you know, I'm in the same message that Brother Branham and Brother George Pike was in, and that's the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I may not have the measure that those brethren had, or may be nowhere clear, but I'll tell you what, I like what I've drank of. Amen. Well, let's talk about this resurrection for a minute. As we're speaking about different doctrines, you know, a lot of people have a different idea of what the resurrection truly is. We find right here that this sister, you know, she had a different thought of the resurrection. When he come and walked among her, he's thinking, or she's thinking, well, yes, I, I have faith in what you believe in. You know, the people out here amongst the denominational church world, brothers and sisters, when they take and put their hope and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they really truly believe that he is the resurrection. And they're looking at this resurrection as a futuristic perspective of thought and you know and we could say that when we differentiate the resurrection between a natural physical and spiritual resurrection that there is a truth that they're standing on so we can't chide with them that they're in error because they really have a truth but where we wouldn't say chide but we would want to bring some revelation and some understanding to them just as the lord jesus said there he said i am the resurrection and you might say, well, how could he say that he is the resurrection and he had not yet been crucified yet? You see, and this is why many people, they will put things into a chronological order. And they'll put things into a, a perspective of such that they can't receive what truly is. You know, many people are waiting for the blessings and the provisions of God and they think they come after they go by the way of the grave. You know, they say, well, you know, now I can enter into my reward or now I can do that. And see, there's a, there's a truth in that, brothers and sisters. But if you're waiting for all of your reward on some distant future or some kind of hope in the future, you've missed the understanding and the revelation of the Lord that He is now. He is the I am. He is ever present with us, brothers and sisters. And we're walking in the demonstration and the power of the Spirit of God in this day and hour. You know, we shouldn't put everything off into the future and thinking about everything into the future. You know, but then yet there's a fine balance here in our in, our, in midst of the Pentecostal brethren and the Pentecostal churches. See, they put everything into a manifestation in the perspective of the natural. You know, if they're going to talk about the things of God, you know, or the vindication of God, they're looking for everything naturally speaking. And if they don't see it naturally speaking, then they, then they get a, a deferred hope or they get uh, shipwrecked somewhat within their faith. Amen. You know, when you get amongst the, the Pentecostal realms, they're looking for the natural healings. They're looking for people to get up out of the wheelchairs, to get up out of the beds. They're looking for the eyes to open up. They're looking for the ears to open up. And if they don't see these things, things happening they miss it and you know when we and, you know speaking of brother Branham and the way the Lord moved in his life you know when he came in you think of then they say the great and the last prophet and uh, you know and we say the law and the prophet son to John then the kingdom of God preached you see I don't chide with them some of you might chide and say well we don't believe that brother Branham was the last prophet we believe it was brother George you know and you might get into these kind of chides but I'm not going to go there with you but I can say this that brother George uh, considered himself much greater than the prophets you know he said that he was a son of God. Amen. And he come with a different message. His message, Brother Branham's message, was vindicated, brothers and sisters, yes, by healings and by people getting natural eyes opened up and people learning to walk and all those things. And it came with that demonstration of power. So did the Lord Jesus Christ's ministry come in the same way. But brothers and sisters, when you get into the mind of God and the revelation, you know, what good is it for a man to get his eyes open and go on into hell? What good is it for a man to get out of a wheelchair and walk and walk right in this broad path of destruction and go into hell what good is it brothers and sisters to get a man's ears opened up that he can go listen to the perversion and the filth of the religious order and the religious world what good have you done you might have taken a man that God had him in a special place when the word says lay hands on no man suddenly he might have been in a place of, of affliction and suffering that he's uh, no longer walking in sin because of the life of suffering and all of a sudden you think you're doing a great thing of God and you come and lay hands on and, and you adjure that demonic force in their life that kept them possibly if whatever it may be and you think that you've done something but you see when you're in the spirit and walking watching things by the mind of God in the spirit you see brothers and sisters there's people that are coming alive in your midst there's people that are dying in your midst there's eyes that are coming open and there's other ones that are being closed out 
you know, and, and you have to learn to watch it by the Spirit of God. You know, I remember uh, in Brother Pike's home over there, uh, and my mother was still alive and come over there, and, and, um, and he was speaking to her, you know, about the Lord. And all of a sudden, the tears came in Brother George's eyes, and the tears started coming, and he said, he said, this is what I give my whole life for. You know, there wasn't no sirens that went off. There wasn't no great noise of heaven. There wasn't no bells jingling. My mother didn't do a cartwheel, a backflip. She didn't do anything. But he said, I saw the Spirit of God enter into your mother. Amen. You see, he was living in another world, brothers and sisters. And sometimes we, uh, we live in these kind of worlds that, you know, we, we think that there's got to be a certain thing in a manifestation that we see with our eyes. But many times there's things in the spirit realm that are manifesting right before us of people being cut off or, again, people coming to life and, uh, and the average person won't ever even see see that i've been ministering the gospel and the lord would share with me and saying if you do not do thus thus and thus the blood's going to be on your hands you know and as a preacher you know you uh with the fear of god in your heart you don't want to go there you know it's like oh my you know god i I sure don't want blood on my hands and you pour out your heart and you preach and you pour out your heart until you get that peace god says okay you've done everything that you can do now you've delivered the word with love and you've done everything that you can do and you get that peace but what does that mean for the individual? You know, did they receive? Did they, did they partake of it? Did they eat of that? You know, that's, that's uh, you know, it's another thought altogether. You know, and people could be absolutely separated right in the midst. Go on right out the door. I remember one night over here in a men's meeting one evening, and a brother come in and, and uh, protested against Brother Pike and his word and made some allegations against him. And we as the brotherhood wasn't going to sit there and listen to this man come against our pastor. So we, uh, as a group of men, got up and ushered him out the door and asked him to leave. And Brother Pike said, Brethren, you don't realize what you've done. He said, Brethren, what you've done is you've ushered him out into outer darkness. And he spoke right there that very evening. He said, the dart strike through the liver, speaking of a scripture in the Old Testament. And it came to pass, brothers and sisters. So sometimes we don't actually watch. We look at what we see you know, with our eyes. We, we hear what we hear with our ears. We didn't like what we heard the man saying, and we made an action and done something in the way. And you say, well, did God have his way in it? Well, I'm sure he has his way, and he has his way in all things. But you see, there's sometimes things happening beyond what we're looking at. And many times we're making judgments and watching things by what we see with our eyes. And we're making judgment out of a wisdom that we think that we have gleaned over years of watching and, and programming and listening and uh, different things. And we take and we will glean from an intellectual wisdom that we have gathered from watching over many things, and many times that will let you down. I remember speaking with people about discernment. Do you realize that there is an intellectual discernment? And there's people, and even psychologists train, and they go for training how to, when a man comes into their midst, that they could look at him, and the way he moves his eyes, and the way his forehead does, and the way his eyebrows do, and the way he looks at certain times, that they discern somewhat about this individual. You know, they, uh, they could discern if he's truthful or if he's lying. They could discern many things about him, you know, by doing that. And, you know, there is a lot to do with intellectual discernment. And you can many times tell when somebody comes into your midst if they've had a good day or if they've had a bad day or if they're not feeling well or, or if they are. But if you depend on that, you're going to find that it's going to let you down because a man will come up and put his arms around you and say, I love you. And, and as Brother Pike would say, he felt the cold knife going into his spine. And, and the thing is, so, so there's a discernment in the spirit far beyond that. So if we start looking at the way in the natural of an intellectual way and of a, of a natural healing, we got natural physicians, we got spiritual physicians, you know, we've got resurrections, brothers and sisters, and people have got their hope in a natural resurrection resurrection and these people that are looking for a natural resurrection and they're waiting for the eastern sky to roll back like a scroll and they're waiting for the grave to come forth and many of them have their hope set within that and that's what they look for and you say well is that wrong brother rob it it's i can't say that it's wrong but i can't say that they're walking in the spirit of resurrection amen what we're looking for brothers and sisters is to understand what jesus said do you realize brothers and sisters that when you're walking amongst the dead and walking amongst the people of this 
this world, that you are the spirit of resurrection walking among them. And you need to break beyond the the, uh, bondages of this world and the things of this world. And there has to be a present day truth and a present day resurrection within your own life. Amen. You know, we could talk about the stone rolling back over there uh, in Israel. We could talk about uh, the stone rolling back in our, our Savior, our God coming forth out of there. And we could rejoice in the resurrection and talk about Him being the resurrection. You know, and that's an awesome thing. But you know, brothers and sisters, that old stony heart is going to have to roll back. And it's going to have to move in the spirit of resurrection. The Lord Jesus Christ in His present day and hour is going to have to come alive within your life. And you're going to have to bring Him out in the resurrection and let the kingdom of this world, this fleshly part of you, become the kingdoms of our God and His Christ that He can reign forevermore. You know, so oftentimes we got our distance set or our hopes set to go out here in this world and win it over to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to go out and take this world over, do those things, and many times we've lacked to do this one right here. There's many times that missionaries and evangelists are out trying to win the world and they're losing their own soul or losing even their own families. I can say this, when a man of God makes a sacrifice, even to his own natural children seeking after others, God will not uh, leave him in despair. He will draw his family. And many times that man or that prophet's without honor in his own household anyway. And as he's seeking after others, the Lord will draw them up. But I'm saying, brothers and sisters, and the fact is that we're going to have to start coming to these truths and the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ and bringing these things alive. And this will be our conversation in the way that we speak and in the way that we talk. Because so often, you know, we find ourselves talking and putting things in a distant future or a hope. You know, when the Lord said that He is the I Am, you know, when He said that He is now, brothers and sisters, and we got our hope thinking, well, He's going to do this. You know, I, I talk to ministers, a lot of ministers, and try to encourage them and help them. And many times, what... There's things that bring flags up, you might say, if you want to say just the red flags, and say, well, I'm going to do this. When you hear a minister say, I'm going to do something, and they always put it off as, I'm going to do something, as in the future, it usually doesn't come to pass and doesn't happen. What you're looking for is a man says, I am doing this. I am doing whatever it may be. You know, if I'm going to wait and get something done and start tomorrow, minister, a man that's, he's fallen away from God. He's not even ministering or doing anything now, but uh, he walked among us at one time, but he called me uh, a few years back and he said, you know, brother, as soon as this thing happens, he was trying to get me involved in an investment with him and uh, trying to get me to invest with him. And he said, you know, I'm going to be a millionaire, he said. And as soon as I make this, as soon as I get this million or so dollars, he said, I'm going to go start visiting churches. You see, I didn't, wasn't discerning that his business deal wasn't good. I wasn't discerning any of that. He's telling me about it and I'm listening to it, you know, like, hey, should I give a few thousand bucks here? You know, it might be a good return, you know, and I'm listening to him. But when he made that statement, when he said, just as soon as I, as this happens and as soon as I get this money, I'm going to go start visiting churches. That's when the flags went up and the Lord said, it isn't going to happen. He might have been. Now, I don't know. He might have been in something that could have been lucrative or prosperous. But let me tell you how God works. When you put the callings of God over here and hinging it on something over here, God will get in the way of that. Do you realize that and stop something that could have happened? You know, my father has just come to a, uh, a revelation. He, he hooks up with us on, uh, by the way, a telephone in all of our services. And he called me up the other day and he said, you know, son, he goes, I didn't understand a lot of things. And he said, I was listening to you the other night and, and he said, I felt like the Lord had showed me some things that took place in his aircraft business. And I, I guess he didn't understand that. And I didn't understand it when I was there neither. But you know what? That's what I was. Because, you see, I had my uh, hope and set in a career, and I loved doing what I was doing, but see, it was in the way of God. Sometimes we think that we understand God, brothers and sisters, and you think, well, it surely wouldn't be God, you know, to destroy a multi-million dollar aircraft business because you're called into the ministry. It surely would be of God to do that. It's funny how people think that they know their God and what their God would do. I had an individual come to me the other day and they said, well, let me tell you, I've been in prayer about this and I know God would not do this. And I listen, I think, they don't know God, not the one I'm listening to. You know, when, when does God always make you on the path that you want to walk on? <laughs> you know, when does he always have you doing what you want to do? 
You know, I'm a servant of the Lord, and it's not always that way. I don't always get to go where I want to go or do what I want to do. And, you know, and I'm content in that because he's never put me anywhere that, that he was not there and prepared the way. Amen. And we find ourselves in some peculiar places sometimes, but we find that God has ordained it and put us there. You know, but as he said this, and he, you know, he thought that, you know, that uh, as he started to understand, I reminded him. I said, yes, Dad, I was Jonah on board, and God had to do this. I remember making a statement the other day as I was about the scriptures. And, you know, we find the Lord, and he's over here speaking to Moses, and he says, Look, I want you to go back over there to Egypt and free my people. You know, so what does Moses say? Well, praise God, I've got me a, I've got me a vision. You know, the Lord's entrusted this thing to me. I, you know, there was a lot of squawking and things, and he had to get some help for someone to speak for him there, Aaron. But, you know, he could have said, you know, I've heard from God, and I know what the perfect will of God is. It's for me to go to Egypt and free the people. But you know what's phenomenal that we never think about? At the very same time, the same God that's over there speaking to him is over there doing what? Hardening Pharaoh's heart. <laughs> He's over there hardening his heart, saying, don't let him go. <laughs> and you think, well, why would God do this thing? Why would he be over here hardening his heart and sending this other one over here? You know, brothers and sisters, I could say the same thing with the brother that called me from Oklahoma. You know, and he, he could be saying, no, you know, God, I, I've, I've, I've been faithful. I've read your word. I really truly believe that you're a healer. I've seen it for many years, Lord God. I've seen this uh, power of the Holy Ghost. I've seen the visitation of God. I've been healed myself, he might say. I've seen other miraculous things. But then yet, all at this very same time, there's affliction and sickness within his body. And you say, well, that's not the will of God. Well, he said he has his way in the preparation of man's hearts from God. And he has his way in the good and evil. So how can you tell me it's not his will? Was it not his will for Jesus to be on the cross of Calvary? What a terrible thing when we think about the afflictions and the suffering that he went on. Was that not his will? It had to have been his will, brothers and sisters. Even though, even though we find him crying out, Hey, if this cup could pass from me, but let your will be done. Then we find it as that spirit pulls away from that body, one crying out, Why hast thou forsaken me? You see, we have to rend the veil of that and understand it. And sometimes the manly part, that fleshly part of a man saying, Oh God, where are you at? Where is this great healing attributes? You know, I've stood, I've seen you. There was a sister that came to one of our meetings there. And wanted to sing a song. And gave her the opportunity to come on the platform and sing a song. Well, boy, she had the microphone. Boy, I was grieved with the sound man. Because, I mean, if I would have been on the soundboard, I would have just cut the volume off. It was cranked up. We had a tent meeting. We was outside. And I would have just had to crank this volume down. And I don't mean that wrong, but that's what I would have had to do because I found that there was another spirit crying forth. You know, it's one thing for the spirit to cry forth in the, in the love of the Lord and maybe get in exuberance or whatever. But I started hearing this thing crying out, My God, you've healed this one, why not me? My God, why did you do it for them and not me? My God, why did you do that? And you say, well, that's the human part of man, and we've all done that at different times. Brothers and sisters, that's the part that's got to die. That's the part that we've got to kill out. That's the part that we can't give ear to. We can't be listening to these things and those kind of thoughts. We've got to cast those things down. When you hear that man crying out that God isn't the same or he's done something for others when he's no respecter, but brothers and sisters, if there's affliction in your body, if there is some kind of a thing happening within your life, then there, you better just say, thank you, Lord. I know that your grace is sufficient. I know that this was the preparation, Lord God, and that you have seen me loyal and faithful enough with enough spirit of God within my life that I could stand against this infirmity to bring a light or to bring and show forth the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. What is is it in your life that you're walking in today that doesn't glorify God? You see, if it's not glorifying God, then it's something that you can change. It's something that you can do. 
You know, because your life isn't in obedience or because you're not walking in the demonstration and the power of God. But brothers and sisters, when it's infirmities and afflictions or despair or whatever those things are that come, you need to find the mind of God in it. And he will lead you through it and give you the strength in it and the power in it. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter what it is. You need to believe in the word of God that you are the resurrection. Amen. You know, when you keep talking about him being the resurrection, that's the truth and it's an awesome thing. But what good is it to know that he is the resurrection unless you have the same spirit dwelling in you that the Bible said? He said, the same spirit that dwelled within Christ Jesus shall dwell within this mortal body, brothers and sisters, and it will raise you up from the dead. Now you see when you're thinking like this and just as Lazarus come forth out of the ground, you know, and we can think, well... You know, that's going to be the day that they put me in a box. And this is going to be the same spirit that brings me up out of that. I'm talking about your dead works. I'm talking about now while you still yet live. The Bible said that there's many that are twice dead, plucked up by the roots, brothers and sisters. And there's people that walk among the dead in this day and hour. They don't have the true genuine spirit of life, the genuine spirit of resurrection, the spirit of Christ dwelling within them. We've got to call forth this resurrection, brothers and sisters, and it's today. It is today. It's not a distant hope it's not a futuristic thing that's going to take care of itself you know when we got great brethren like brother pike out here we say that it's gone and entered into a rest or sleep it's not death brothers and sisters you know it's not our faith that's going to bring him up out of that ground brothers and sisters he's got that spirit of christ and it's going to come forth it has to it isn't something we got to wonder about it isn't something that we say this now but i i could say this that we have to have that resurrection power coming forth now we're not waiting on it we're not looking for it we're not talking about it we need to bring it forth and let him live and let him walk among men in this day and hour whatever measure it is that it's not a competitive thing it's not for you could have more than this one or i'm the man or you're the man brothers and sisters be content in whatever measure and whatever spirit of god has given you and you walk within that measure and he will strengthen and draw you and lift you up that all men could be drawn unto him amen because we are the resurrection we've been partakers with him we become one of that many membered body it is risen it isn't waiting it's not long Longing, it's not looking. It is the present day truth. It is the hope. It is the now. If you keep deferring that hope, people are going to be sick. If we keep on saying, well, you know, hang on. Praise God. Someday, you know, he's going to return. Oh, just hang on. Praise God. You know, he's going to come in the clouds. Brothers and sisters, the people are going to find themselves falling away. They're not going to wait. They need a God that is alive and well today. They need a God that is I am. And the only way that they'll believe that is by seeing him manifesting within your life life by you yielding your members over to him 100% and giving your body as a living sacrifice as just your reasonable service and saying God here I am use me don't get big ideas of what you think you're supposed to do there's so many people that think that they can't have enough humility in their life to get in and help another brother to do something that they've got to be the one that's uh, you know up front or the guy that says you show yourself loyal and faithful in the little things and God will recognize that and he'll raise you up to whatever it is whatever he has in his foreknowledge of your life and you say well if God knows this and he's going to have to do it and I say but let him and get out of the way and then so many times we get it we get it all pre-thought you know I find that the things of God by the spirit are, are never in a bunch of pre-planning I know that uh, brother Pike he said well y'all go ahead and set your itineraries and I'll just find the mind of the Lord you know and if I find the mind of God then I'll go you know, go ahead and make your plans and make your schedules and do that. And if I find the mind of God. And, you know, sometimes people ask me, hey, could you do this or would you be here or would you do that? And I say, well, you know, you know I'd like to, but, you know, I don't know. If I make plans and he changes them, then sometimes I don't like to make plans. I just go whatever, wherever he says to go or do whatever he says to do. And, and I could say this in that, in that thought, as again looking back at Brother Pike how many times, you know, it would be hard to know exactly what he was going to do. His wife over here could testify to the fact that many times she probably didn't know at 9 o'clock in the evening that she was going out of the country the next morning. All of a sudden, he says, hey, pack the bags. You know, like, hey, what happened to a little bit of planning here? You know, what happened about this? But see, there is a guy that's doing all the planning, and he makes the way and pre prepares the hearts, and we go, and we walk in the Spirit of God, whatever it may be. But as I was saying there, there are so many times we think that we're going to find the mind of the Spirit and have it all laid out. 
You know, it's like God says, well, this is what I want you to do. And he's going to have the road map all laid out and say, well, this is where you're going to go and this is where you're going to go. But I'm just telling you, I, I'll t- I say I'm just testifying to the fact that it isn't the way it works with Brother Rob. You know, he doesn't say this or that. I can remember in the Pentecostal churches, you know, and, and wanting to be to yield my members to the Spirit of God and to the move of the Spirit. And I can remember being in a service and the Spirit of God came on me so strong. Many years ago, it came on me so strong that I couldn't stand up. My knees were buckling. I was holding on to that pew, and I'm thinking, oh, my. And it was the spirit of prophecy that come on me, and I'd never had that happen. It came on me so strong, and I'm holding on to this pew, and I didn't know what to do. And I'm holding on to this pew, and then all of a sudden, this thing lifted right off of me. And then all of a sudden, there was a man just a little ways down, and he started prophesying. And I learned something right there. You see, when the spirit of prophecy come on to me, it wasn't like I had this whole uh, message, we might say, to speak. It wasn't like all of a sudden he said, hey, this is what I want you to say. And I'm thinking, I don't know if I can remember that. You see, but he wanted obedience to start speaking. And then the unction of the spirit of God would move. You know, and when we look into the Bible, if we read the stories in Hebrews 11, and we go and look at these great men that have done great exploits in faith, I believe that, they, that every step that they took was a step by faith. I made a statement the other day about even talking about Moses bringing him out of Egypt. I'm sure that the Lord gave him a big old list about this long of telling him where all the warehouses were with all the food as he went out across there. I'm sure he said, well, these engineers have already gone before you out there and they're going to take and make you a nice pathway out across this sea. You know, he didn't have that. He took off by faith in God. And every obstacle and every affliction and everything that could come amongst them came. But it was still the move of God. And God showed himself in it. If those things wouldn't have happened out there, we wouldn't understand God in faith. We wouldn't understand God as a provider. We wouldn't understand him in his power. And when he hardened Pharaoh's heart, we would have never saw the demonstration of the power of God of the people of that time. And so many times when there's things, it might be afflictions, it could be sickness, it could be this, and we always contribute it over to the devil. But then yet we need to somewhere say, God, I know you have your way in the good and the evil. Lord, I know that you're having your way in these things, and let me submit in this perspective. You say, do you submit to the sickness? That's not what I'm saying. Do you submit, you know, to, the, to death? That's not what I'm saying. We've passed from death unto life. That body part is on a, on a collision course going in that direction. It has nothing to do with that inner quickening of that spirit. You know, if your eyesight's going dim or your hair's changing colors or letting loose or whatever, you say, oh, man, he's just not a man of God. He must not have faith. Well, I'll tell you what, I've seen a lot of great, awesome men of God, bald-headed or gray-haired or whatever you might say, brothers and sisters. I cannot know a man after the flesh in the perspective to understand the spirit world and understand spirit life. But what we do to understand the spirit is the quickening of that spirit and the speaking of the word of God and what is spoken forth. You see, and it doesn't matter what people are looking at and what they see with their natural eyes because when they're looking at what they see, they're going to forsake their own uh, mercies because that's the lying vanity. So we're going to have to learn to differentiate and start ringing some bells and speaking things by the Spirit of God. You know, and many times we put that responsibility over on the preachers or this and that, but it's got to become a present truth in your own life. And you're going to have to start speaking again this resurrection life within you and start speaking that and believing it and quit submitting to the lying vanities of the pain and the agonies or the sufferings or the sicknesses. And you need to rejoice in the Lord and knowing who you are in Christ. And it has nothing to do with the infirmities of that first man, Adam, knowing that it's appointed unto him to go to dust, to go back to the grave. And and it's appointed unto him to that. But you keep that spirit of youth and strength and power of the Holy Ghost and let it come forth in your life, in your conversations, and speak forth those things, brothers and sisters of life. Amen. And when you truly come to that revelation and know that you're not waiting on a resurrection, that you are the resurrection, you'll walk differently, you'll speak differently, you'll judge things differently, comprehend things differently. Because you're not going to comprehend it with your mind of religious study. You're not going to comprehend it with what you think. 
You're not going to go by great quotes of Brother Pike or Brother Branham or whatever. You're going to have that spirit. When you've been resurrected, it's the same spirit that dwelled within these great men dwelling in you. In whatever measure it be, but it's the spirit of wisdom and understanding and revelation. It's the spirit of power, brothers and sisters. And it will make you walk upright as an overcomer. You'll walk with the demonstration of that spirit. It would be hard for so many times. And this is where you have ring the bell right here. There's some fine lines. One say, well, I can't really hear what you're saying because I see this in your life. Brother Pike said something one day right down there in the basement. He was speaking about some revelational truths. And he looked me right in the eye and he said, Brother Rom, he said, it don't matter what happens to this man. He said, this word is the same today, yesterday, and forever. It's alive. And this word is truth. Amen. You see, brothers and sisters, we couldn't know him after the flesh and say, you know, what kind of spirit would have been? Say, well, hey, Brother George, you know, what kind of spirit would have been if I said, where is this healing? Where is this resurrection power? Where is this great God you've been talking about? You see, what kind of spirit would that be? It was the same spirit that stood before Jesus when he was on the cross. We can't yield to that spirit, brothers and sisters. And we no longer could know Brother Pike after the flesh. We'd have to know by the spirit of resurrection, the spirit of Christ dwelling within his heart. Amen. And this is, you know, we could look back at him and speak about him. But what about you today? You know, what about you? We could talk about the great things that he done. But what good is that doing for you? We can talk about the great messages we heard or the great times that we was on the evangelistic field with him or the great reproofs that we all stood under. You know, and I saw yesterday as we brethren getting around reminiscing about the things of God. Boy, you remember when he got you down in the basement? Yeah, you remember when he got you over here? Yeah, we could talk about those things. But that was the manifestation of God, the love of God in that present day and hour right then of the love and the compassion of God saying, brother, the things that you're allowing for and the things that you're doing in your heart are going to um, separate you from God because they're displeasing to God and you've got to get them out of your life. That's the manifestation of a present day resurrection walking in the demonstration and the power and the authority of love and bringing forth the correction and, and the reproof, the rebuke or whatever it is. But see brothers and sisters that didn't die 10 years ago. That didn't depart and leave us 10 years ago brothers and sisters. The same God is alive and well. The same one that manifested in the forefathers He's alive and well today. It's in a many-membered body. And, you know, you could say, well, I don't maybe see it like I want to see it in Brother Mike or in Brother Rob. I'm not talking about Brother Rob and Brother Mike. I'm talking about you right now. And what, what power are you walking in? What demonstration are you bringing forth? Who do people know you after? Amen. You need to be known in the resurrection, in the demonstration, the performance of the love of God within your life. Do you realize that if Brother Rob Coons is lost on his way to hell up there in North Carolina, it surely isn't going to justify you in lasciviousness or lukewarmness or well you know I'm just not going to do it you know where can you pick up if you come in here and say well I don't see uh, brother Mike just like brother George or this and that so you know I'm just not going to help I'm not going to get a vision well you don't have the spirit of resurrection dwelling in you if you if you had that same spirit that dwelled within Christ and you saw a brother and you might have uh, seen something where maybe he lacked in you'd get right in arm in arm with him and say brother let me strengthen your hand and let me help you because that now two of us could walk together amen and we can do something and many times people don't want to submit to anything because because they want to be that headship. You know, I had a minister come into the church up there in North Carolina, and he made a statement. He goes, I am so sick and tired about hearing this George Pike. And he said, I am, and we need to, you know, I need to take that as a little bit of a reproof, and for I could use a little bit of wisdom. Here's a man that never knew him. Well, matter of fact, he did meet him one time. He was a minister from Oklahoma, and he came over here, and he did meet him one time. But then he was saying, he, goes, he said, I go over here to, um, in Oklahoma, and I go over here around uh, Kenneth Hagin's people in the ministry, and I said, are you Kenneth Hagin this, and Kenneth Hagin that and Kenneth Hagin that. He said, I'm tired of it. He said, I go over here and it's George Pike this and George Pike that. And I, I reproved him openly from the sacred desk and, and I just told him, I said, brother, I said, the reason it draws you up and you come against it because I said, nobody's honoring you. I said, you don't have enough God in your life that people could say, you know, this brother had done some great exploit. And thanks. And brothers and sisters, there's a, again a fine line in some of these things. And, and the man had been stumbled and staggered and double minded and starting to work over here and starting to work over there, never fulfilling anything, never finishing every, anything. And he's just tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and didn't know where to stand at. And nobody would say, Oh, yeah, this brother's done some great thing and lifted up his name because there wasn't anything there to lift up. So they think that no man should be lifted up. The Bible does teach us to give honor to who honor do. 
And this is Father's Day. We need to honor our natural fathers on this day, brothers and sisters. And we need, and there is honor due. You may not be in agreement. You might be come to some born again experience and be a Christian. You might look back and say, well, my father's lost on his way to hell. That doesn't change the fact you need to honor him as your father and respect him. That don't mean you submit to him and let him lead you off into worldly ways or do that. But there's still an honor there. And the thing is, is we've all had a great father in the gospel, Brother Pike. And there should be an honor, brothers and sisters, to him. And the way we honor him is like some of the things we saw yesterday. Honoring the, thing, the, you know, the work of the brethren and the forefathers have come here and sweated and brought blood to bring these buildings up out of the ground. And the least we could do is keep them up and to take care of those things. See, that's honor. You know, we think, well, I honor him. I listen to his tapes and I've got this great revelation. I've listened to some great revelations that people think from memorization of Brother George's tapes. Revelation isn't a mystery. Revelation isn't uh, quoting him or understanding what he said or what he did. Revelation, brothers and sisters, is Jesus Christ in you, a living hope of resurrection. When he's alive in your life and you bring forth that resurrection power in you and you're walking beyond reproach and keeping yourself unspotted from the things of the world and it's no longer you speaking but Jesus, that is the revealing of Jesus Christ in this present day and this present hour. He is still the same, brothers and sisters. He's still a, he is still a life and we need to bring him forth and let him be alive within our life. We, uh, we had a great example here. It was honoring a father in the gospel again. We had a great example. And what that example was, was telling us is it's possible, brothers and sisters, to, to bring that man under subjection. It's possible to kill Rob Coons out. It's possible to kill Brother Jimmy Smith out. It's possible to let them men no longer live and let Christ live, brothers and sisters. It's not, it's not the ministry. He never promoted the ministry of Brother George Pike. If you listen to him talk, he, he didn't put his name on the ministry. He said it's the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not the revelation of George Pike. It's not the revelation of William Branham. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. He told us that over and over and over again. And the thing is, is he brought, he submitted himself. He killed himself out that Christ could live. And it's your turn. It's your responsibility. It's not good enough to talk about what Brother George done. The only thing that's good enough to talk about is what God is doing in your life today. And what you're walking in and dwelling in. This place may never be the same as it was when Brother George was here. But that's not what you're responsible to. What you're responsible to is what are you doing, you know, and what is, what is happening in your life. And what have you submitted yourself to? What have you making yourself available to? You know, it doesn't matter what happened here 10 years ago. What matters is what's happening here today, what's happening here right now today. What are you making yourself available to? You know, we say, well, there's not as many people here, this and that. Is that the preacher's responsibility or the preacher's problem? Why aren't they here? Maybe you haven't showed the love of God like you should show. You know what drawed me here? Yeah, it was Brother Pike, the word of God in his heart and his life. But the day I came and showed up here was on a, it was on a Saturday. And this place was buzzing everywhere I looked. There was men working and they were fellowshipping. They, and they had the love of God and talking about the Lord. And I'd never seen a place like that. You see, that draw the guy from, you know, 2,600 miles across this uh, United States over because I saw the love of God. What if it was just Brother Pike here? He was here all by himself and I came over and met him. Would it have the effect? Would I have drawn or maybe made the decision before I got out of the gates of this parking lot to come back here? No, but I saw the love that he had, but it was demonstrated in you. You see, you were a, a representation of him and what he done. So if he's passed away, does that mean we just do away with all that now? How do we honor him today? And what do we do to honor him? Are we in retirement? Did we die with him? You know, you, know, you might say, well, you know, I've already done it. You know, man, I traveled the world with him, you know, and I made myself available. You know, I'm in retirement now. When did Brother George retire? I bet you if you ask his companion, I bet you he was preaching the gospel up to his last breath and, and, and talking about the love of God, wasn't he? He was talking about the power of God, I'm sure, the whole way, and talking about uh, the Lord. When do you get to retire? When can you say, well, I can't? You know, I know some of you are more elder now than, than you were. You've got ten more years on your life now. And you say, well, Brother Rob, I just don't, I can't do what I used to be able to do. 
Maybe you can't climb up on the roof like you used to, but there's young fellows coming around here that you need to encourage and exhort them in the love of God. You need to talk to them and, 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 uh, as an elder and exhort them in the things and the what's pleasing unto God. Amen. No, Brother George isn't here walking among us that they could say, go over there and do this and that. But you know what, brothers and sisters, I believe this, that the same spirit that dwelled within our pastor is still alive and well dwelling here amongst the many-member body. And it might be in you in whatever measure, or another brother in another measure, and we need to exercise that. You know, you say, well, I don't believe I'd ever get where Brother George is at. You sure won't ever get there by sitting and doing nothing and wondering, you know, what you're going to do since he's been gone. If you want to ever get to where he was at, you better start doing what he did. He started, he, he was a man that pressed in on a daily basis. He was a man that brought the resurrection hope alive every single day. He was a man that cast down what his desires and thoughts as a family man or a husband or whatever and put those down and sought after the kingdom of God first and started pressing every single day. I heard him on a tape one time make a statement about being filled with the Holy Ghost. And he said, brother, he said, I'm doing everything I can to stay full of the Holy Ghost. You know, sometimes we have these Holy Ghost experiences. You know, where we say, man, I was in a great camp meeting. The Spirit of God fell. You know, I danced. I spoke in tongues. You know, I prophesied. So what? <laughs> if that's what you're, is that what you're looking for for your strength? That power that you was took a partook of and that strength and that life that was the rain and you just need to you need to keep walking and and in the power of god and a demonstration of the lord it should be a daily activity in your life it should be something in your life that you don't have to talk about something that happened 20 years ago to testify about you should be testifying about maybe yesterday you know praise god i left here yesterday i was weak in my body i was wore slap out but you know i came over and committed my labors unto the lord and i worked with the brethren and had a good time Amen. You find pure sleep when you do those kind of things. And you find rest, you know, and you start, again, you've, because of you've committed your works unto the Lord, you'll find your thoughts established. And you'll find that same mind that was in Christ Jesus, that same mind that was in our pastor, Brother Pike. Well, all of a sudden, you'll find it resting in you. And you'll find it speaking to you and, and, and talking to you. Amen. Brothers and sisters, there's no difference in this day and hour. I like what Brother Mike said a moment ago. He said, man, you're talking about the good old days. Brothers and sisters, you know, where is your God? Did he die? If you're going to be looking back and saying, boy, those were the good old days. You know, I could look back and talk about the wonderful times I had here. But brothers and sisters, if I truly love that man of God and truly believe that he was a father in the gospel and I truly believe that his word was truth, I have a responsibility today. You know, if I was back in the aviation business and my father flew an airplane in the side of a mountain, there would have been a great load put on me. And I'm sure that I would have felt like I couldn't have handled that. And many times I could have looked and said, man, he's a great, you know, this was a great pilot. You know, if I had a group of people in an airplane, I'm flying along and we get into a bad storm, the airplane's thrown all over. They don't want to be on the PA system saying, hey, my dad was a great pilot. They don't want to hear that. You know, what about you? <laughs> I hope you can fly this thing. You know? Oh, man, he was real good about pulling these things around through the uh, thunderstorms. You know, real good at reading the instruments and doing around that. But, you know, what about you? You know, there's a time that i got to quit talking about my dad being a great pilot. And i got to start getting a hold of the, the yoke of that airplane and start vectoring this thing around some of the storms out there and bring the people to a safe place. Brothers and sisters, there's a responsibility in your life. And, and, and don't take this disrespectful. It's like the man said. He goes, I'm tired of hearing about this George Pike. You know, I use Brother Pike as an example. He put things in my heart and taught me things and brought me to an understanding. You know, he was the guy that, that was doing everything he could to kill me. You know, and it's still a responsibility. Oh, Brother Rob still got some dying out to do. You understand what I'm saying? But he done everything he could to do that. You know, but brothers and sisters, you know, we got to go on. And do that. And this guy, you know, I could take what he said. I could say, oh, he's just a reprobate. I'm not going to pay no attention to anything that the brother said. But, you know, i got to take that as a lesson. You know, maybe he should have heard more testifying about what we're doing today. And maybe more testifying and said what, what this great man of God did or said. You see, there needs to be a demonstration in your life, that resurrection. You knew Brother George in the resurrection. You knew him in the resurrection of Christ. He brought the demonstration of the spirit world to life and manifested within what you saw as Brother George Pike. And brothers and sisters, we have to do the same thing. Let the resurrection be alive and well in your life today. Let this resurrection come alive in you. There is a responsibility in each and every one of us. I see a lot of young'uns around here. You know, I look at Brother Kevin, they're holding a baby. 
you know, and it, and it don't seem like it was all that long ago that Brother Kevin wasn't too much bigger than that. And, uh, you know, but what about the responsibility? What about this other child sitting here? He never, he, that little child never did meet Brother George. But you know what? He needs to meet the same spirit that dwelled within Christ Jesus, the same spirit that dwelled within Brother Christ, or with those, Brother George, the same spirit that dwelled within them. Brothers and sisters needs to be dwelling today and being an example, each and every one of us. If you say you loved him and you missed him, the thing is, is there should be, that, and that's understandable, but there should be the thing is about carrying on and taking the load of responsibility. When did this all fall on Brother Mike? And if you say it's his sole responsibility, I don't see it that way. It's a bodily ministry. And if it's all Brother Mike's uh, responsibility, then what is your responsibility? What is your calling? What, what, what do you want to do? And some of you might sit back. There's so much jealousies and envies and strife everywhere you go. I'm not saying that in a harsh way to you, brethren. But I'm saying everywhere you go, well, I'm not going to do this because you put this guy in charge. Well, maybe that guy made himself available, and that's why you used him. And you would have brother used you, but you're never around or never available. And maybe you could be being used if you'd make yourself faithful. And then when you say you're going to do something, you start it and never finish it. So pretty soon you find it going another way. And there's nobody responsible for what you're not doing except you. Well, it's different. What's different? And why is things different? Maybe you're the one that's made a difference because you're not submitting. You know what made this place strong and powerful? Because people submitted to Brother Pike because they loved him. And his words had a strength. You know why his words had a strength when he spoke? Because it was not him speaking, you might say, and it was Christ speaking. But you know why we discerned that and knew that? Because the man was a man of his word, and when he spoke to do something, he would carry forth and do it. He wasn't numbered as a double-minded man or an unstable man. When he spoke and what he said, he would perform and do. So if he is our father in the gospel, we may say, what about you? Have you taken on that same attribute? Do you tell somebody you're going to do something? You know, I've got a son. And when he speaks to me, I'm sorry to say, I can't put no strength of anything he says. He's so unstable and so double-minded that I can't, you know, he says, hey, Dad, I'm going to see you tomorrow. It's like, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, that's all I can say. You know, you say, well, you shouldn't talk about him. I'm not, I'm not talking about him. I'm just talking about what he's doing. He says, like, you know, hey, I'll do this. I can't put no strength with it. Is that my fault? Whose fault is it? It's his fault. He's a young man. He needs to, when he, his, his words need to have strength. I don't want to be numbered that way. If somebody says, ah, you never know what he's going to do, he'll tell you one thing and do another. Whose fault would that be? Could I blame it on somebody else? No, it would be my own fault for doing that. Let your word be what it is, brothers and sisters. When you speak and make a vow to do something, you need to fulfill it and you need to go on with it. It's easy to get before a group of brethren in a men's meeting and say, oh, yeah, I'm going to do this. Oh, yeah, I'm going to do that. But you know what? Let's do what we say we're going to do. And if you're putting things out there that are so big that you can't accomplish, start out with something and make yourself faithful and loyal in something small. And Lord will recognize that. When he sees an ability and a calling in your life and you're making yourself faithful in the small things, he'll raise you up. He'll put you where you need to be. If you think you've got to be up there, you'll never get there. But when you humble yourself and through humility, you'll be exalted. And he'll put you where you need to be. Amen. He, he wants to use your life in the fullest potential of whatever you'll submit. You don't have to prove to anybody who you are. God knows who you are and knows what measure you're in. won't put more on you than you could bear. You know, people talk about church growth. You know, well, how big's your church? You know, hey, it's big enough. <laughs> I don't think I could handle it anymore. You know, man, if I had, you know, more like that, Brother Rob couldn't handle it. You say, well, I think you should have a big church with hundreds in it. You know, if God could help me and strengthen me that I could handle that, but I'm telling you the God's honest truth, it's hard to handle a handful. <laughs> you know, how about a natural father? Sister Betty and Brother George had eight kids. You know, man, four was plenty for me. <laughs> I'll tell you what, four, man, that was a tough. It's still tough. You understand what I'm saying? You say, oh, man, I want 16 kids. I don't know if I would have handled 16 kids. I never had a suicide spirit, but 16 kids might have put one on me. You understand what I'm saying? You know, God knows what you could bear. Brothers and sisters, and I ain't trying to be anybody. I just do what I can. Hey, if I could win one soul in North Carolina, and after it's all said and done, it comes to contribute and say, you know, Brother Rob won one soul into the kingdom of God. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord for that one soul, brothers and sisters. You know? And uh, you say, well, you think you might win one. I hope so. I truly hope so. You know, there's one way to know that we want a soul. It's when they endure to the end. 
You know, people come in zealous. They want to do something for God. Boy, man, praise God, I'm here, man. You know, praise God. But let's see if there's an endurance to the end. Let's stand, brothers and sisters, in what we believe in. Let's stand in faith. Brothers and sisters, let's don't be moved by every wind of doctrine. You know, God's the same today, yesterday, and forever. You know, I've heard people say up here in the Carolinas, they say, well, you know, Brother George, an old-timer. You know, that's, that's old-fashioned. You know, hey, man, praise God. You know, this is a charismatic move now, man. We're in this move and this and that. You see, I can't submit to that because I came out of that. You understand that? I've come out of that already. I can't submit to that. You know, brothers and sisters, let's stay in the Word. Let's stay with the Word of God, and let's stay that was set and established and proven. Amen. You know, sometimes we could look and think, well, this isn't necessary. I'm going to share just a couple things. I won't keep you long. When I came here, there was a lot of things I didn't understand, and I'm sure there's still a lot of things I don't understand. But see, when I came out of a church world, brothers and sisters, they didn't preach segregation like Brother George preached segregation, to keep the men and the women separately and out of the offices. You know, and I thought, well, you know, there's a side of me, and I thought when I come here, I said, well, hey, we're all Christians, man. You know, why do we have to have these kind of segregation stuff? We're all Christians. And then the Lord spoke to me one day, and he said, just look back. So I looked back, and what did I see? I saw my heart broken many occasions where ministers went off into immorality, ran off with women and did different things. I mean, it devastated my, my hope and faith, brothers and sisters. I love these men of God. Numerous. I could share stories out of Oklahoma and Missouri and Nevada and California where my heart was broke. And it's like, man, man, what do you do here? When Jimmy Swagger fell, the first time the Lord had separated me from but there was a time I really drawed from him and loved him. And when those things happened, you know, I mean, it shipwrecked a lot of faith in a lot of people. Because this is where they were looking and where they were putting hope. But you know, as I, I thought, well, these things aren't necessary. But then the Lord said, look back. And I looked back and I said, you know what? These things are necessary. There was a man of God with wisdom and understanding and saying, you know what? We can't have these men and women intermingling in offices. You know, if there's spots and blemishes in the Feast of Charity, you know, or if when the sons of God came to present themselves, the devil was there also. We need to watch for those things. And he done it right and in order. I wasn't involved in holiness work and never probably been in a holiness church until I came to this one. The churches that I was involved with and things, you know, it wasn't uncommon for the preacher to wear short pants, to be at the, the church picnic on a Saturday in his shorts. I mean, that was a not, it wasn't an uncommon thing out there. I remember when I met Brother George down here on a Saturday, he pulled this picture out, and I'm sitting there in the chair by him, and he pulled this picture out, and he said, Can you believe this? And he put this picture up, and it was some preacher that he knew over in the Bahamas. And he said, can you believe this? This man calls himself a preacher and a man of God. And look at him there. What an abomination. And I look at that thing and I go, I didn't say nothing. <laughs> my dad's sitting next to me and my dad, you know, i never seen my dad in short pants in my life. But I'll tell you, about two weeks before I was sitting there in that meeting with Brother George, I was in a pair of white painter shorts up on a ladder painting some carnish on a house. And, man, he's sitting there going like that. And you believe this? Man, I just kind of dropped my head, didn't say anything. I looked over at my dad like, you just shut your mouth. <laughs> you know? And my dad's sitting there going, amen, amen. <laughs> you know? It's funny how some of you have different power or different victories in an area. You know, Brother Pike be wearing out about sports, and you're going, amen, amen. Another guy's got his head dropped because he was just listening to the ball game. You know? Hey, that was one thing he wasn't sword me with because I didn't care about sports when I come here. About everything else he preached about and against, I'm going, oh, me. But when it comes to sports, like, yeah, amen, Brother George, lay it on him. You know? and, uh, and that's where many of us are at in different times and different ways. But as I heard him say that, you know, it was something totally foreign to me. But see, brothers and sisters, it had become a conviction in my life. It had become a conviction of me. You know, I've moved off 300 miles away. If I wanted to go back to those kind of things, why couldn't I? Why couldn't I go back to stripping off or, or whatever you might say? But you see, there was something that changed in my heart and a conviction in my heart. When we showed up out here, pulled in across the street over here, my wife was wearing a pair of jeans. And we pulled up over there, you know, and, and uh, she looked over here across the parking lot. And she said, I'm ready to go. All these ladies come out in their dresses and all the little children come out in their dresses. She said, man, I'm ready to go. And I said, man, we just drove 2,600 miles, man. I was excited about being here. You say, you know, I want to say, well, didn't you know God before you come? Yes, I did. 
I was starting to wonder if I'd ever knew him after hearing Brother Pike preach. I sat up there the first service, and man, I'll tell you, it may as well have been in Spanish because I'm going to slap over my head every bit of it. I asked Brother David the next day, I said, man, what was he talking about? And he said, well, he was just kind of capping off a lot of things for many years. But, you know, I listened to that message four years later, and I comprehended it and understood it. You see, it's something you had to grow into and understand. But he was preaching another world, brother and sister, that I wasn't accustomed to. But I came and did the best I could to submit to it and learn and grow in it, and not war against it and fight against them. And, you know, say, maybe I don't understand it, but the Lord helped me. And he said, hey, do you remember what happened in the churches out there? Do you remember the heartbreaks and the things that have happened of the immoralities and things? And all I had to do is look back. You might not think it's necessary for your wives to wear long dresses. I was just Brother George. I heard one of the black sisters that was in this church, and she said, uh, she said, she goes, well, those were Brother George's convictions. She don't feel that it's hers. You know, and, uh, and goes on. But you know what, brothers and sisters? If a man look upon a woman and lusteth after he committeth adultery... Some of them said, my own son said, you know, that I'm guilty of being ritualistic. I listened to him talk. And I listened to the way he talks about many of you brethren and different things. Oh, they're just religious, you know, ritualistic. Brothers and sisters, I don't call holiness ritualistic. It's a conviction. He is the spirit of holiness. God is. And the thing is, brothers and sisters, if, you know, and you say, well, you're under the law. Well, I believe the law of the Lord Jesus Christ was much greater than the law of Moses. Moses said that a man would have to be in the act with the woman. But Jesus said a man to even look upon her. It goes into a thought world. You know, so you can say that I'm ritualistic or religious or righteous or self-righteous. But you know, I've come to an understanding of understanding the Word of God. And I'm going to do everything I can to walk in the conformity of the Word of God. And I've tried to discern the things that Brother Pike taught you and taught me. And say, well, you know, what is this? Is this something I could put away with? Is this something from the 40s or the 50s or the 60s or the 70s? You know, is this some conviction of something and now we're in a new day and hour? Brothers and sisters, Jesus is the same. And what he taught our pastor was through, a, through a wisdom and understanding and watching and seeing people fall away from God and giving place to diverse lust or whatever it may be and saw him fall away. And he said, look, I know a way. His name's Jesus. I got my hand in his hand and follow me as I follow Christ. And God is a God, a holy God. If you're women and you strip them off in tight fitting clothes and men lust after them, then how can you say that you're a soul winner? How can you say that you're concerned for the lost when you do those kind of things? Brothers and sisters, we need to stand with what we know is right and we need to stand with holiness. Our convictions need to be godly and holy, and we need to line up with those things and be an example. I shared a story the other day at church. My wife and I was walking through Walmart, and we're going through Walmart, and a man came up to me, and he just seemed to be almost in a, a, a desperate man. He was probably somewhere about probably 60 years old, maybe 65 years old. And he said, he said uh, brother, I don't think he addressed me as brother. He said, sir, he said, you're a Christian, aren't you? And I said, yes, sir, I am. And you, could, and you know, I can't stand here and say, oh, yes, he saw this great light emanating from me. I can't say that. I can't say that, oh, man, the guy had a gift of discernment. He discerned the Spirit of God in me. That's not what I'm saying. He said, I looked at your wife. And he said, I'm, he said, I'm sorry. He goes, I wasn't trying to look, but he said, I looked at your wife and saw that the way she was dressed and knew that you must be a Christian. He said, I've been a truck driver. And he said, I've been on the road for 20 some years. And he said, I used to go to a Pentecostal church. He said, I've fallen away from God. He said, I need prayer. He wasn't talking about prayer tomorrow. He wasn't talking about prayer when I went home. He said, I need prayer. He said, I need prayer right now. And we had a prayer meeting right there in aisle five in Walmart. You understand what I'm saying? And it was because somebody had a conviction in their heart to dress that becometh holy according to the word of God. You understand that? So maybe there was one soul that maybe got enlightened and got some help and got some strength. Amen. So what are you doing? What are your convictions? You say, well, we can't take one case of that and make a doctrine on it. We're not taking one case, brothers and sisters. What's going on in your life? How are you presenting yourself? If it offends your brother to eat meat and we're not even supposed to eat meat, then what about, about the way we dress and the way we do? 
Brothers and sisters, we need to have convictions, good, godly, old-fashioned convictions, if you want to call them old-fashioned. How old are you talking about? I'm talking about 2,000 years back to the cross of Calvary, and we need to walk in the same discipleship that the disciples were under. They were disciplined. Disciple is a disciplined way, and they were disciplined into a lifestyle. And if your religion is offering you just a lukewarm, little civish life and praise God, and, you know, just Jesus and him crucified, I done come out of that. I done been through those things and it didn't work. Yes, I learned some things and grew in the grace and knowledge of God. I can't say that God's there because His rain's there. I can't say that it's God because of the rain of God. Brothers and sisters, I shared this story not too long back. I was in a preaching over in, in uh, Missouri at a place um, called Stockton, Missouri. And there was a man, 74 years old, on the platform. He played the fiddle. And I mean, he could, man, he could saw that thing in half. And I mean, he could flat play the fiddle and he was good at it. And I mean, every time I was in service with this man, and every time he was there, he'd have his hands lifted up the Lord. He'd sit that violin down. He'd lift up his hands to the Lord and the tears would come down. He'd speak in tongues, you know, and this and that. And I thought, man, this is a man of God. I was very young in the Lord and I was, uh, I was under some other ministers and they were trying to help me to grow into the ministry of the Lord. Well, a pastor friend of mine called me up one day, and he said, Brother Rob, I need you to go over to Stockton with me. And I said, yeah. You know, hey, I wanted to make myself available. Praise God. Let's go. And he said, Brother such and such, this man I'm talking about, 74 years old, had molested his four-year-old granddaughter. And he said, we got to go over and, and uh, counsel him. I said, I'm not going. They tore me out of the frame, brothers and sisters. I mean, it shipwrecked my faith so bad. I said, man, I'm not going. Brother, and, I'm not, I, and I didn't go. I was young. I didn't know how to deal with anything like that. I was in another church over in Oklahoma, and the pastor had cheated me and lied. I didn't know how to deal with that. You know what I did? I packed up and moved. That's the only thing I knew to do. And it came to a point in my life that God made me start having to deal with these things that I couldn't walk away from them. And it came to a point in my life of that. And you say, well, why do you say these things, brother? Because let me tell you something. You know, what some people are calling old-fashioned brothers and sisters is something that has proven itself. And it's godly and it's virtuous and it's righteous and it's holy. Amen. And it gives you the power to separate from the world. It gives you the demonstration and the power of God. When the Bible says, dress is becometh holy, there's a reason it said that. It said, present your body, soul, and spirit. Holiness isn't just some kind of a work as an invisible work. The whole thing of the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ is bringing a revealed of the invisible things of God into a manifestation within this body, within this life. You understand that? That's the whole purpose that we walk beyond reproach, not for our salvation. We don't live this kind of life that we could be saved, brothers and sisters. Salvation has been granted unto us the free gift of God. But we walk in the demonstration and power of God and holiness that other people could see the good works of the invisible world, Christ, manifesting within your life, amen, that they could be drawn by God into the things of God, amen. That's the revelation of the Lord. Let Christ live within your life and if there's things in your life that you can't see Jesus doing then you need to consider I had a man that was chiding with me about smoking and I said just close your eyes a minute and he said why and I said I just want you to just close your eyes he might have thought I was going to maybe smack that smoking thing off him after he closed his eyes I don't know but I said just close your eyes a minute and I said I want you to picture yourself standing on the sea of Galilee looking across it you know, and I said, just stand there and picture yourself looking across it. And I said, beautiful, isn't it? And I said, can you see Jesus walking along the shoreline? Can you see him with a marble hanging out of his mouth? It don't fit, does it? I can't see that. How about you? Could you see him in his short pants and his flip-flops? Well, I'm asking you. I mean, I'm not trying to be ignorant here. I'm just saying. I mean, there's things that we can't envision and we can't see them. Why can I or why could you do that? If you can't see him doing that, if we're to be Christ-like, then we should be Christ-like. Now, you could dress properly as becometh holiness. You could be a sister in your long dress and be on your way to hell. The dress ain't going to save you. You could be a whitewashed sepulcher. 
So, you know, we got to understand these things. Just because you dress right and look right and can quote Brother George or Brother Branham don't mean you got the goods. You understand that? You need to have the spirit of resurrection dwelling in you, the spirit of life. Amen. But when you have that, it's going to come forth and manifest itself in holiness, brothers and sisters. And your actions are going to be godly and holy. Your speech is going to be as holy. And you're going to talk right. You're going to be beyond reproach. You're going to keep yourself unspotted from the things of the world and have a good name within and without. Amen. And that's because you got the spirit of resurrection dwelling in you and he's come alive and he's alive in your life today and in your heart. Amen. We could talk about what Jesus done, Brother Branham done, Brother George done, but let's talk about what you're doing. Amen. That's what I'm excited about, to see what you're doing, that you're going on in the word and in the message, and that you're doing your part. If Brother Mike's lost on his way to hell, that's not going to justify you to live like you did and depart from holiness. If Brother Rob's lost on his way to hell, if Brother George Pike was in hell, nowhere would that justify you to go on and live the way you think that you could live or live in this world or be part of this world. Amen. The word of God is true and let every man be a liar. And brothers and sisters, we are commanded according to this word of God to give our body as a living sacrifice and that's just our reasonable service. We ain't done anything to boast about or to do but we just need to get on and go for the Lord amen and with some of our elder brethren maybe if they're uh, been out there on the battlefront for a while go over and ask them say man sh sh show me how to hold that sword up show me how to hold that shield of faith amen and you elder brethren be taking these young men and you need to be talking to them and encouraging them and that you know that the battles and I will say this in close and I can remember brother Pike up here talking about what well, would you like your youth back he was presenting questions and answering them. Y'all remember that? He said, hey, would I like my youth back? He said, no, I've done been down that wilderness. He said, hey, you want to go buy houses? He said, I've already been there. You want to go buy this and go buy that? He said, I've been there. You see, brothers and sisters, some of you have been through some things that you see these young fellows that are lusting after or looking after or wasting their life seeking after, and when they get a hold of it, they're going to find that it doesn't bring peace. It doesn't bring satisfaction to them. And you need to be uh, uh, responsible to the fact of what you've seen and pour your heart and your life out to them and tell them, say, brethren, you know, this is, this is what's proven. This is what's just. This is what's right. Think on these things, these things that are virtuous, these things that are righteous, these things that are godly, these things that are holy. We don't need to be going out here sampling and partaking of things that have already proven to be wrong and fall. We need to take a hold of what has been uh, given to us, the mind of Christ, the revelation of the Lord, and we need to go forth with the demonstration and the power of the Spirit of God. Amen. Let's all stand together. Let's give him a hand. Amen. I love the Lord. I'm not I'm talking about giving me a hand. I'm talking about giving the Lord a hand because His Word is true. His Word is alive. And His Word is the same today, yesterday, and forever. Amen. Hallelujah. I may not have the eloquence of presenting a message to you like a great man of God could, but I can tell you one thing. There is a spirit of word and truth that's still alive today. Amen. And I'm encouraged. Hallelujah. God bless you all. I love you. Brother Michael. We hope this message has enlightened and encouraged you. If you would like to receive other messages and teachings from Brother Rob, please feel free to contact us. Our web address is christiantempleonline.org or you may write us at Christian Temple, 3842 Mount Gilead Church Road, Sophie, North Carolina, 27350. We, the brothers and sisters of Christian Temple, would like to invite you to come worship with us. Our services are at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning and 7 p.m. on Wednesday and Friday nights. We are located at 3842 Mount Gilead Church Road, Sophie, North Carolina, 27350. For directions, go to christiantempleonline.org map. Thank you again for listening, and may God richly bless you.